This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And thank you for joining us. With me today is our co-host Richard Fields and a friend of the show, John Cameron. So Richard, why is it easier to lose a cosmetology license than be decertified as a police officer? Well, two reasons. One, the police unions are extremely powerful and strong, and uh, the uh, public perception, kind of a dated public perception anymore now, but the public perception is the police officers are a necessary profession, and uh, cops do no wrong, and they're always in the right, and you can trust your neighborhood friendly officer, whatever. Uh, now, well, well, hold on. Where, where are you living, Richard? What country are I? I Never mind. I said that's ahead. a dated perception. Uh, ah. Secondly, the uh, cosmopolity, uh, cosmo, uh, cosmetology licensing uh, situation is such that uh, the uh, people who are in the in the uh, business of doing cosmetology want to make sure they're the uh, essentially only people doing uh, business as cosmetologists. So they have uh, basically uh, done a regulatory capture of the agency licensed to or that does the licensing of cosmetologists to the point that uh, they're able to effectively prevent uh, a huge majority of would-be cosmetologists or any other practitioners of anything that could be remotely described as cosmetology from, from getting licensed by requiring, for instance, hair braiders uh, to go to a cosmetology school to learn all about everything that they're not going to be doing anyway in order to be able to do a business of braiding hair, that sort of thing. It's basically regulatory capture. Yeah, I was reading in the article, I believe it was of the Washington Examiner, that it actually takes more hours to be a registered cosmetologist, I believe in New Jersey, than it does to be a police officer. Yeah, well, there are many places where you have, there are many small town police departments and probably some uh, larger ones where there are no uh, qualifications necessary to be a police officer. In fact, uh, many police departments uh, actively uh, prevent uh, more intelligent people from be becoming uh, police officers because they don't want too many to they don't want anybody to be smarter than chief i guess i'm not really sure what the the reasoning there is but other than oh, they want you're gonna to get to you're gonna get so many tickets after saying that richard oh my gosh well, actually, not richard, anymore you know, i do so, know the theory behind that i actually do know the theory they're working on behind that the, the theory is that high intelligent police officers will get bored and leave and they don't want to insert resources in training them to be a police officer and then have them go do something else. May I may I say something? That yeah. Actually, now most people, for example, in Sacramento, if you want to be a sheriff, you pay your way through the academy. They don't. You have to actually spend your own money to get trained. And they'll want you to go through an academy, which I think is, I don't know, somewhere between 8 and 13 weeks. Uh, so they're not even spending money on training. They're having somebody else uh, train, and the, and the people are paying for their own training. Now, some... Some cities and towns do it. I don't know about Sacramento police, but police, but for the sheriff's department, you pay your way through the academy. Um, so, you know, these people are are, are being uh, trained, and I think the uh, fella in Floyd in Minnesota that was shot, uh, all of the, the police people were graduates of a technical college in in um, an outside vendor in Minnesota uh, that trained most police officers, and they had stopped um, using the technique that the guy used on Floyd four years before, I think. And um, they'd also uh, said that it's only to be used until the man is uh, basically restrained. So they had the guy in cuffs and were still standing on his neck. So, you know, the problem with training is, you know, training is only as good as, as uh, you know, following it. And uh, anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted, Richard. You were, you were talking about why. No, I'm going, I, I said why. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, to be to be very very quick about it. It's uh, regulatory capture, uh, trying to prevent other people from joining the trade in the, in the instance of cosmetology and uh, police unions capturing the the process. So it's almost impossible to fire uh, a policeman uh, in the case of police. Can I throw out a quick a question? I know that there there are people who. Um, higher private fire departments when we had all these horrible fires uh, near rich folks in Malibu and the rest of that, some famous people had, uh, they knew that they, the local fire departments wouldn't either couldn't or wouldn't respond to their calls. 
um, and they hired um, private firefighters to do it. I'm, I'm wondering yeah. um, if, uh, you know, based on this, there might not be a movement to have people say, now we're going to opt out of, of uh, let's say, Rancho Cordova policing, or we're going to opt out of Oak Park policing, and we're going to hire uh, a private um, firm to do our policing here locally that reports to the local councilman. Or something well, like it's that. already happening. In fact, there are more uh, private police officers uh, called security officers or security mm -hmm. guards than there are policemen in the United States today. That's, that's, that's already well underway. And you have uh, also the phenomenon where uh, police officers are spending so much of their time going after, after uh, victimless crime uh, mm -hmm. laws, prostitution, uh, drug, uh, mm -hmm. other rights uh, laws, that they really don't have time to do anything other than uh, write down uh, some of the more serious crimes that people call the police department about. Like, for instance, in, in San Francisco anymore, uh, if you uh, shoplift more or less than $1,000, they're not even going to open an investigation. Mm -hmm. So shoplifters have figured out that they can shoplift less than a thousand dollars, and they go scot free. So is uh, that please, including tax? Never mind. <laughs> what yeah. tax? Uh, no, I mean it's a situation where uh, we already have more private police than we have public police, and with the uh, defund the police movement, that may uh, be uh, uh, accelerate. And of course, if you if your homeowners association or your neighborhood uh, hires a security force you don't have to uh, ask them to uh, enforce laws that nobody cares about anyway. Mm. Well, so speaking question, about, go ahead. I'm sorry. About, well, I was going to move on to the next one because we're sitting here talking about police officers doing investigating victimless crimes. And it's sitting here. Number two on our list is this a school, a teacher called the police on a family for having a BB gun on his son's back wall while he was doing a Zoom class. And the police came, did an investigation, searched the house, found nothing wrong and left. But what if it hadn't been an upper middle class white family and it had been a you know lower a lower class black family that had had the police called them because there was a BB gun hanging in the on the wall? Would it have gone so well? I mean, we yeah, were they probably, they probably would have sent in a, 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 a SWAT team. team and shot the shot the uh, somebody in their sleep. I mean, that's yeah. that's happened just in the last few days. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. But we have these we've actually created a tattletale society. We are watching how people call the police on all kinds of small, stupid things like what the lady got fired for calling the police on her neighbor for writing the black lives matter on his own house. And now she got fired and which I suppose is fine, but we've created a tattletale society where if you see something, say something, we've taught people that for 18 years now, 19 years. And there's a, there's a consequence to that, right? Isn't it uh, 1984? Isn't this a, a very, very, very parallel, parallel, if that's overuse of adjectives and words, um, to 1984, where, you know, basically half the population's job or the people were monitored through their TV at all times or through TVs all over the place and, and uh, people were required to rat out uh, uh what was the thinking called? Incorrect thinking. And, and in this case, politi in, in incorrect political thinking, was that right? No. Politically incorrect thinking is being ratted out now, depending on who you are. So it's, uh, and we know that all of the, of the various internet providers and search engines and everything, except for, keep my fingers crossed, DuckDuckGo, I'm not aware of them doing it, or are basically opening up their books to every federal agency. So it's uh, yeah, there's even a word for it now. It's called uh, Karen. What? It's called. There's a word for it now. It's called Karen, as in Karen. Uh, I want to talk to your manager because of you know some stupid thing. Yeah. Or I want to talk to the cops because of graffiti on uh, my neighbor's wall that he put up there himself. Yeah. Or so how, what? How's it spelled? Karen. Just like Karen. <laughs> Yeah, the, the name, Karen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, words, first, uh, a, busy, a busy buddy getting into everybody's business, uh, complaining. You know, it's also used as a, a term to uh, denote uh, somebody who is operating from a position of privilege. Mm -hmm. Well, what's it in time? In our times, what, what Miss Kravitz from across the street on Bewitched would be the Karen of our day, the ones I know. <laughs> That's who I think about when I think of of the modern day Karen, it's Ms. Kravich on Bewitch, the neighbor across the street who's always poking her nose into businesses that wasn't belonging to her. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's lots of them. We have, uh, we, we have 
people on, on our store. We, I live in a great little neighborhood and people keep an eye out and everything. Nobody, I mean, you can't get a new appliance in your house without somebody knowing the brand and how long you had the old one. I mean, it's, you know, it's observation, but they don't rat each other out. We used to have some people in the neighborhood that, that ratted people out for violations of the, the uh, uh, association rules, you know, your, your tree was a quarter of an inch too high or you planted the wrong plant or something. And, but I'm, I guess that just means I'm, I'm living in a world very similar in my neighborhood to, to leave it to Beaver, whereas people in other parts of the country are living in a world where during a virtual meeting, somebody, you know, calls the, the security officer reported to the police that the weapon in the home during a Zoom meeting was unsecured. Is that correct? No, it was a, a, a child, 12-year-old kid, I forget yeah. exactly how old we were, was, having, was in class, yeah. and, and behind him, on the, what mounted on the wall, was his, his BB gun and like a bow and arrow, because he's an yeah. archer, and, and so the teacher got upset about it, reported it to the principal, and then the principal called the police, the police came and did a whole investigation about a BB gun in the wall. Even daisies are weapons of uh, terrorism these days. Even yeah. what are? Daisy, Daisy BB gun. Oh, Daisy, uh, what is it? Daisy air yeah. rifle. Yeah. Yeah, the little red rider. You know, you're going to blow your eye out. You're going to you're going to shoot your eye out. It's but is that really a call for the police? You know, it's, it's really it, hard to do that. You know, you have to reverse the gun and stick your eye <laughs> right in there, and it's pretty tough. All right. Sounds like you've tried. Uh, <laughs> well, no, no, I've done some stupid things, but that's one I haven't done. I remember, you know, holding little tiny. Uh, Ladyfinger uh, oh, and firecrackers, firecrackers in, in my teeth and having them go off. You'd hold them in your fingers and, you know, you'd ramp up the challenge to where you do a slightly bigger one. And then, you know, once somebody was bleeding, we usually cut it off right there. But, uh, you know, thank goodness nobody put a put an M80 under a bucket and stood on. Oh, wait, never mind. Somebody did that. But, um, <laughs> we can't talk about the stuff we got away with as children. It'd be criminal offenses today, which is funny because my grandfather told me that when I was 16 years old, you know, the stuff I got away with as a child, you can't do today. And I had that same conversation with my children when they were, you know, hitting that teenagers, you can't get away with the stuff I got away with. It's a different time. Uh, um, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Next, next subject. You're right. Well, we're going to skip ahead for a subject because we were talking about zoom and big brother. We might as well go ahead and talk about how zoom suspended the account of Americans at the request of China because they were having a meeting about Tiananmen Square. Yeah, and and I, I heard about that one. And uh, didn't they, they reinstated the account afterwards? But uh, chi the Chinese government um, got to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they got to take control of content for a meeting that ran, did the meeting run in, in the U.S. exclusively or were there members of? There were members of the China? meeting in China, but they suspended the account of the person who started the meeting in the United States. Well, yeah, not, well I mean, it, it's a private company, okay? Zoom is a yeah. private company and a private company, uh, you know, uh, you know, essentially can do whatever they want. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're not required or they shouldn't be required to uh, kowtow to any country's uh, censorship or uh, mm -hmm. if they want to obey, any country censorship they should be able to the question of course is uh whether or not they are under regulatory pressure uh to uh bow to a, a given country's pressure and obviously they are in china i'm sure that china would have said or you know was in a position to say you don't uh get rid of this uh, account quit talking about Tiananmen square we're going to make it impossible for you to do business in China. And China is part of their supply chain for some of their technology. So that, that could be a big problem for them. Um, so, well, the election is yeah. coming up. That brings up a very good point because the Internet providers and people who provide the, the, the hardware and the software are not responsible for content on websites because they are basically a blackboard. But when they start editing that content or censoring it, um, like with the upcoming election, um, then according to the law that was written to keep them from being uh, held liable for content that other people post, once they start monitoring that, 
they're going to lose lose that that exalted position of being held harmless. So it's interesting. You're talking about Section 230, which uh, yeah. the left is trying to use to say uh, it's trying to get rid of. They're trying to say, okay, we want we the left want, and for that matter, we the right want to have control over what Facebook or any other uh, social media website uh, puts up. Uh, we don't trust the private sector to do it themselves, and we certainly don't trust individuals to say what they think uh, without without our beneficent uh, you know monitoring of whatever is politically correct, depending on our point of view. So you know, getting rid of Section 230 would be a bad thing because it would make it much less the, the internet would be a much less freedom oriented place. Mm. Um, but you you raise an interesting point. If Facebook and Twitter and the rest start doing editorial content and by editorial content i think what you're talking about is essentially uh editorial uh judgment by omission in other words omit covering a certain uh, viewpoint or omit uh, letting somebody's ideas be propagated uh, mm -hmm. to the extent that others are that could uh, add ammunition at least to the fire to uh, repeal section 230 which ultimately would be a bad thing yeah one well, it's already happening it's certainly happened in in the lamestream media, and it's obvious to me on all the popular, uh, the bias. And I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, a, a Trump fan, but the the anti-Trump bias uh, is frightening. Um, yeah, I mean, you and, can say that. And, That's certainly yeah. true with uh, New York Times, Washington Post, and all of the uh, uh, most of the TV networks, with the exception of Fox, which is where the exact opposite is the case. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a threat of regulation, just as good as regulation. If a bunch of politicians, say here in California, say we're, we threaten, we're just essentially threaten Facebook or whatever to start regulating content, or we're going to regulate you, you don't even have yeah, to that's, ask regulation. That's, that's what's happening. That's why. That's why you're seeing uh, Twitter, for instance, uh, uh, put uh, you know explanations on why what Trump what Trump is saying is is not true, uh, mm. and that kind of, that kind of editorial so, uh, well, action. So don't they have to basically? I don't think I've heard a politician other than maybe uh, Jorgensen and a few others say something that is true in the last ten years. So don't they need to put that 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 same thing up whenever uh, gruesome? I mean, Newsom opens his mouth, or Biden, or or uh, uh, Senator Whitehall. Yeah, I think, I think, I think uh, it goes without saying if a pop, if a politician's mouth is open, he's not telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, the exception of James Justice, of course. <laughs> I'm not really a politician. I pretend to play one on TV. Uh, <laughs> I'm a terrible politician, which, you know, maybe that's a good thing, yeah. right? Maybe that's, we need worse politicians, and maybe we can have some honesty up in there. Maybe people are <laughs> bad at politics and, and good at telling the truth. That'd be a good thing, and it'd be certainly be refreshing. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to, you know, not shout out. We can't use the term on this show, can we? I'd like no. to not shout that every uh, 10 seconds while I'm hearing any politician talk. What's worse is these folks that are running these omnipresent and all-powerful independent regulatory agencies. They just make stuff up and enforce uh, rules that they made that carry the weight of law without without anything. But I'm getting on my usual high horse, so <laughs> let me shut up. Here. Well, we've got... I've got a thing here. We're talking about politics, and you can't talk about politics without hypocrisy. And I, I hear you wrote a, a press release that was picked up by the Washington Times. Do you want to talk to us about that, Richard? Yeah, yeah. The Washington. Uh, this is for the Joe Jorgensen campaign, and uh, the uh, Washington Times picked it up. It's a it's a press release regarding the Justin Amash bill, which uh, is now actually a tripartisan bill. Uh, it's received co-sponsorship from libertarian-leaning Republican. Congressman uh, Tom Clintock, as well as uh, Ayanna Presley, the, the, uh, the, the squad member from Massachusetts in the House. Uh, the bill would uh, get rid of a qualified immunity. And qualified immunity is the uh, legal doctrine. It's not a law. It's a legal doctrine uh, enacted back in, the, I think, the 60s by the U.S. Supreme Court and, then, mm. and since uh, uh, strengthened, which says that, in effect, it's impossible for an ordinary citizen to sue uh, a policeman or any other public uh, employee if they're engaged in discharging their duties in a good conscience manner. And, they're, and the way it's been interpreted is pretty much anything is uh, in good conscience. You can shoot a guy in the back. Well, he was, you know, he had a, 
uh, a cell phone that looked like a gun, so in good conscience, I was able to kill him. That's mm. the sort of thing that has been uh, let slide through the qualified immunity law, and we're mm. seeing example after example after example of, of that just in the last few weeks, starting with George mm. Floyd and the guy in Atlanta that was shot twice in the back, and, and the, the, the uh, woman who was shot in her bed uh, when somebody was invading, I, I guess, the wrong house. Mm. All of these things are situations where the police officers, they may or may not, in most cases they don't, face criminal charges. But even if they do, they cannot be sued by the families of their uh, the families of victims. Uh, it also applies to lesser uh, malfeasance by uh, agencies, uh, agency bureaucrats in the EPA or other uh, federal regulatory agencies mm -hmm. or state or local uh, regulatory agencies. Uh, if they do something that's immensely harmful to uh, a constituent economically, or physically or in any other way, uh, they get off scot-free uh, under the qualified immunity uh, mm -hmm. court ruling. The tripartisan amendment or uh, legislation sponsored by uh, Amash, McClintock, and uh, Presley would end that once and for all. And that's mm -hmm. uh, an absolutely tremendous thing. It would be interesting to see who in the, um, in the uh, establishment uh, Republican Democratic Party uh, lines up against it, and I'm sure they will. Well, what's what's strange to me is is uh, what's well, not strange that the White House has said it's a non-starter uh, getting rid of qualified immunity, um, and I'm I I wish I would have done a little more research into the history of it because there is no basis in law, there's no basis in the Constitution for it. It's the antithesis of our Constitution. It's the Star Chamber. It's basically that one status or one group of employees operates under different rules and you know the excuse is given that you know we can't second guess people in the heat of battle and that is absolutely not that's nonsense to second guess doctors and you know when they got their hands in somebody's abdomen working on them you second guess people uh, who are professional drivers driving and you know they make the wrong decision and run over a kid on a bicycle uh, you can do that you, you second guess everybody on the planet and hold them accountable for criminal activity or even negligence, much less, you know, misfeasance, malfeasance, certainly you hold them negligent, you, you hold them liable. But somehow out of whole cloth in 19, as you said, 1966, it started. And the perversion of the law is so bad. And, and I just don't understand how judges got to this point where unless there's a specific example uh, precedent set in another court that this very narrowly defined activity uh, doesn't qualify for qualified immunity, then you can't sue them. And and well, I, I mean, have no a case, there was a case in the Central Valley where cops stole actually stole a couple hundred thousand dollars allegedly from, allegedly yeah yeah uh, and uh, no I think they were convicted and because I drive sure. through uh, I drive through the Central Valley so I'm saying and and uh, and you know and they they were not able to be sued under this thing that says that well they I guess they didn't know they were supposed to not to steal from uh, from the public uh, you know, mm, it's, yeah it's, now did they keep the it's, money it's or did they, they give the money back you know I think I'm not, I'm not sure what happened ultimately in that case, but the I'm point just is, wondering if I'm they too old to go sued for doing it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, well, we have the the police. They often talk to us about you know the rule of law. We operate under the rule of law, but we don't. If they operate under a separate set of laws than we do, hmm. if That's if those who enforce the law have operate under a completely separate set of laws, then we don't operate under the rule of law. We have operate their laws and our laws. So That's yeah. not the same thing. And we have to get back to the point where we're all operating under the same laws. In fact, they should, in theory, because they have this power over us, should be held to a higher standard than citizens and civilians. Mm -hmm. And I had a, uh, we had an adopt a soldier and he stayed with us for about a year. And his, um, I, every time this kind of stuff comes up, I says, remind me, you guys in the, at Saddam's castle, you were a guard at Saddam's castle. You guys had a higher standard of you guys had a higher rules of engagement than the police do on these streets. And said, so, oh, clearly we could never get away with the stuff these police do. And this was in a war zone. Yeah, I mean, the this was in Iraq, in a war zone, yeah. The argument made, you know, against getting rid of qualified immunity is, well, we'd never be able to, to uh, you know, keep our police force. Uh, people would quit. And I say, good riddance. We yeah, don't have those kinds that, of uh, I was, you know, macho jerks on the police force. I completely agree because I was at the the bank the other day, standing in line for a for a uh, for the ATM, and there was this young black woman as a security guard opening the door and talking to people. She was talking to an older black gentleman, and they had a disagreement about the role of police. And she says, "I would never wear a badge." 
She would like to be a cop, but she can't wear a badge. So if we get rid of those badge cops, women like her would go off and be good cops. But right now she's not willing to because of all the bad cops and she doesn't want to be related to those people. She doesn't want to be associated with them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree that um, in, in all of the over and over and over again, I want to quote the statistics and I have, so you can just say grandpa and I'll shut up. Um, being a cop is the 12th most dangerous job in, in the, the country. And if you take out traffic accidents associated with being a cop, it for, moves even further down the list. And quite frankly, um, and I want to make sure I'm very clearly understood on this, being a cop should be the most dangerous job in the country. You should go into it with the idea that, that you hold the lives of the people whose employee you are sacred. And if you have to risk sacrificing your own to avoid damaging, much less killing one of them, then if you're not willing to do that, you shouldn't put the uniform on and you, uh, you shouldn't wear a badge. It says to serve and protect. But if you ask, I think it's 57% of policemen what their job is, they will tell you it's to keep order and control. Yeah, I'll give that answer. And I, I should point out that the whole uh, point of the press release uh, that got picked up in the Washington Times was to say that Joe Jorgensen uh, is alone among the presidential candidates that supports the concept of getting rid of qualified immunity. Yes. You're not going to uh, Trump actively opposes it. I'm not sure that uh, Biden has have the uh, the gonads to come out with any position at all. Well, I don't think he has the IQ to understand it. So that I, might be the problem. Yeah, Biden has come out clearly, come out in favor of the the generic police, you know, whether how much he's willing to kind of move to placate somebody is always an open question on that side. But his he's clearly always defended his record and his record is awful. And so I whatever he says now can't be believed. It's just simply. Yeah, we need to remember that Joe Biden was the guy that uh, decided that George H.W. Bush's crime, uh, a war on drugs legislation was not uh, sufficiently uh, rigid and and uh, uh, bad. Uh, it needed to be locked up more, as he put it, violent thugs. Mm -hmm. And of course, drug law violators are usually nonviolent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were attack as usual. They attack the wrong problem. They attack the easy one instead of actually dealing with the long-term issues that we all have to deal with. All right. Well, vote, vote for Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen in uh, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, go to libertariancounterpoint.com to find out more information about the topics we discuss. And there's a couple more on the list. Um, you can catch us on Facebook at Libertarian Counterpoint. It's a Facebook page. I think it's TV. But anyway, you can find us. It's easy to find. And the groups and on social media, press if you're on YouTube, press the like and subscribe buttons and share and do all that great stuff. We greatly appreciate it. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.